Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I love it when people turn their cameras on. <laughs> Good morning, Monica. Good morning, Spencer. Welcome. Welcome to our workshop this morning. And in the chat, please feel free to share your information. It's all about networking as well. You know, with us living in this isolation and all these Zoom calls, uh, getting connected is so important. Mm -hmm. And I'm so concerned we might be in isolation a bit longer. Who knows? <laughs> right. I know. It's like, here we go again, right? Yeah. I was thinking we're just coming out of like COVID. And now we have some other things that we really have to be concerned about. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. Feel free to say good morning. I love seeing those faces and hearing those voices. Hey, Marquila. Good morning. How's it going? It's going great. I'm happy to be up alive and here this morning. Anybody else uh, like to say hello? Hello to everyone. <laughs> so glad you all are here. Oh, hey, someone's coming on with my same name, Antoinette. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Glad to see you here this morning. We have a lot of great speakers talking about strategic information at our Power Positioning Financial Workshop for Women in Business. And if we have a few men for men as well. So good morning. If you'd like to say hello, feel free to say hello to us. Somebody has my same last, my same name, Antoinette. Good morning, Antoinette Elliott. What a beautiful name. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. We have the same name. I'm sorry, I'm working, so I have to kind of stay muted at the same time. Okay, we understand. At least you're here, so welcome. So we're going to get started in a few more minutes. Let's let a few more people in. Let me check the time. It's now 11.02. Anybody like to share anything with us this morning? Any business tips, business resources from our audience? Anything you'd like to hear about today? Markila, Shatikra? Um, I don't have nothing too, too exciting <laughs> right now, unfortunately, but I am happy to be here. Um, it's always good to learn about money and you know how it should be working for for us. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm sure we have a lot of great information from our team of professionals. Oh yeah, if Lita's speaking, I know it's gonna be great. <laughs> I, I have a question. Um, yes, I have just I've been doing a SBA loan, and so you know they ask you for all of these different workshop worksheets. And so I guess I've been manually doing them and I know there must be something that can do these things for me. <laughs> so you're looking at maybe like the, the automation. And I think yeah. from our professional, from Glenda, she's going to cover because she has a lot of banking experience, also Tamika. So they'll be talking about some forms and maybe Glenda, you share with the way to kind of automate some of the processes. That would be good. Okay, Glenn, is that, is that correct? Yes, I will. And and um, if you wanna also just send me a message in chat, um, maybe about what specific things, I'll make sure I'll address those regarding the SBA. Um, the SBA is special, let's just say, um, once you get through it, it's wonderful, but going through the process, it takes some patience. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna get started. Uh, and I wanna say welcome to our December 1st virtual workshop. The, we call this the Power Positioning Financial Workshop for Women in Business. And we have some men, for men in business as well. Uh, I wanna thank you for being here this morning. Uh, I know we all have to get used to living and, and operating in a virtual world. So 
This is not like having it in person, but I'm, I'm glad that you guys tuned in. And I'm sure we have people that are going to join throughout the morning. So let me introduce myself. I'm Antoinette Ball. I'm one of the founders of We Up, the Women's Entrepreneurial Opportunity Project Incorporated. And we are a nonprofit organization located in Atlanta, Georgia. And we're dedicated to supporting the economic advancement of entrepreneurs and women in business. And toward the end, we're going to close out with resources. So I'm not going to talk in detail about we, what we do as an organization, but when we wrap up the uh, workshop, uh, we, I come back with our other resource partners and we'll share what we're going to be doing for the upcoming 2022 year. And we'll share our upcoming programs, events, and activities. So I want to thank everyone for, for being here this morning. And we are going to go ahead because we only have an hour and a half. So we're going to go ahead and start rocking and rolling. Uh, and I want to thank all my resource partners, Glenda, Kimberly, Tamika, uh, Lita, all of you for being here this morning. Thank you for partnering with We Up because, you know, we always say great things happen when women collaborate. And a part of us supporting our community of entrepreneurs is us getting together, sharing information and sharing resources. And I know we have some awesome professionals that have some awesome information that can help you take your business to the next level. So I want to thank everybody for being here this morning. Thank you for your collaboration, for your partnerships. And we're going to walk into 2022 being great. And, and we're going to keep the momentum of collaborating and sharing information and working collectively together. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to Glenda. She's going to introduce our speakers. And what we're going to do is just get right into the conversation because we're going to flow pretty quick this morning. So Glenda, and let me introduce Glenda Walker, which is another great collaboration and share with you. I met Glenda, you and I met probably how many years ago? It's um, been a while. So I would say at least five, six years ago. Yeah, we met about five or six years ago. Uh, and we had a great, I think we met and we met out for lunch, had a great conversation because at the time you were actually uh, with a bb and Bank before it became Truist. So right. we were talking about all the great things that you were doing. So let me share with the audience who you are. Uh, Glenda Walker is the former VP of commercial banking with over 25 years of retail and commercial banking experience. So you guys, with all that experience, you're going to get uh, some great information today. And Glenda recently left corporate America to launch her own business called Relationship Management Solutions, Inc. Congratulations, Glenda, because you. now you're an entrepreneur, you're taking all these 25 years of experience, and now you're uh, working your own business. And in, in Relationship Management Solutions, she works closely with uh, clients. She serves as kind of an advisor for women in business. She coaches, educates, and finds the best banking lending solutions designed to fit the needs of her client base. Glenda is committed to the goal of helping small businesses sustain, grow, assess, evaluate, and she recommends the best financial solutions to reach their financial goals. She educates entrepreneurs and small business owners on the loan process, underwriting, requirements, cash flow, credit, financial management, and efficient banking practices. So Glenda, you are what we need because they always say there's a lack of assets to capital. So you kind of bring those pieces of, of the puzzle together. So I'm gonna turn it over to you to kind of start everything off, uh, introduce our other speakers and just kind of get this workshop flowing. So again, thank you. Thank you, Antoinette. Thank you so much. Ladies, uh, we have some great information for you. It is the end of the year, and it's time to reflect on the year and look forward to the next year regarding our businesses. We have some amazing speakers. We have Lita Speller with Height Wealth Partners. She is a certified financial planner. Lita serves as a sounding board for per personal and business decision making. She fosters empowerment by educating her clients on the risk and rewards of different decisions Lita earned her bachelor's degree in international business management and continued her education by obtaining several licenses to make her qualified to give you great advice and decisions. Welcome, Lita. Thank you, Glenda, for the introduction and good morning, everyone. So excited to be here. Next, we have the next speaker is Tamika Stafford. Tamika Stafford is with Truist Bank, which was formerly BB&T. Tamika is a com community business development officer. She, su she supports small businesses 
and access to capital through traditional banks and alternative resources. She frequently facilitates financial wellness seminars, advising people on business credit, borrowing and access to capital in collaboration with so many different organizations here in Atlanta. She's worked with the Greater Atlanta Economic Alliance, ATL Next, the Georgia Minority Supply Diversity Council, um, the Gosweta Business School, um, the SBA, Kennesaw State. So Tamika and I um, were former colleagues at, at bb and Now Truist, and she is what I call the connector of all people. She connects people in, in the community um, and very resourceful. So welcome, Tamika. We look forward to hearing from you. Okay, Tamika, you might be on mute. So we're actually going to go ahead and get started this morning. And as I mentioned, um, one thing in all the introductions that was mentioned was education. So um, myself and our other speakers, we, we pride ourselves in not only sharing information, but educating. Um, if you don't know the process or understand what you are, what's being presented to you, it's hard to connect that and apply it to your business. So educating is very important to the three of us. But we are at the end of the year and I wanted to share some great resources with you all regarding your business and how to wrap up the year and also um, prepare for the new year. So I'm gonna share my screen really quick and I have a checklist for you all. Can you guys let me know if you can see my screen? I can't see it yet. Let me stop, let me stop sharing for a second. Okay. Can you stop sharing? Okay, now share yours. Okay, there you go. Okay, great. So again, as we look at our businesses and look at what we've done uh, for the year, we definitely want to prepare ourselves to be um, most efficient for the new year. So there's some things that we kind of need to look back at what we did throughout the year to prepare ourselves for the next year. So I have this kind of you know, categorizing two basic um, categories, financial management for your business and your employee and vendors. So let's kind of talk about financial management tools that we need to prepare for the end of the year. Um, as a business owner, you definitely want to look at your accounts payables and receivables for the end of the year. So this means that you're gonna review any outstanding um, bills and expenses that you have. And more importantly, you want to look at any outstanding um, invoices that you have sitting out there, any outstanding receivables. So if you have clients that have not paid you, um, you might have them on a net 30, you might have them on a net 60, you don't want to have them on a net never, you definitely want to get paid. So this is the time now to go back and look at all of your outstanding um, receivables and payables, see if you can collect on those, because that's going to help your year in p and and balance sheet, especially if you're a cash basis company. You want to collect your money. You provided the service. You wanna make sure you get paid for that service in the calendar year that you provided that service. Unless for some reason, the contract you have doesn't apply to that. So again, it's important to look at what you're owed and what you have to pay out. You wanna start in the year off at a good slate and start the new year off at a good slate as well. Pull and review your year in reports, your P&L, profit and loss statement, and your balance sheet. Again, this is something that hopefully you've been doing all year, okay? And when I say hopefully, because um, I know that we're all small business owners, we know that we're making money, but sometimes we don't always document it and record it. It's very important to document and record it through capturing this information on the P&L and balance sheet. Um, in some ways that you can do that if you have not done you want to use something like QuickBooks. Um, there are several online um, tools that you can use to manage your funds, but QuickBooks, I would say, is the most popular one. Um, I basically just do it on my cell phone. So I have QuickBooks on my cell phone. Whenever I get money in, I record it as gross sales, and anything going out is an expense. So just think about it. Let's just say, I always like to use this analogy. You have a child, if we have parents on the line, you have a child and they're in school, they get a report card, right? They get a report card or a progress report monthly, and they may get something during the middle of the, the school season or the quarter. That lets you know how they're progressing in their schoolwork, how they're progressing and what they're going to be doing for it. Well, why not have that for your business? 
you need a report card for your business and keeping those expenses and that income documented is your report card. It'll let you know how you're progressing. If you need to focus on more sales, we always want more sales, but sometimes that's not the best thing. Or if your expenses are inflated, it kind of lets you know where are you spending your money in your business? Are you spending it on things that are not going to get you the most return? Or are you spending it on things that's going to help you grow your business? So definitely look at some online tools um, like QuickBooks. Um, um, your bank may have certain tools to help you keep financial management reports. If you just Google um, online accounting tools, they probably start anywhere from $12.95 a month on up to $50 a month, depending on how robust you want to get. But I would just say at least start with something very basic so you know what you're doing. Okay. So the next thing is bank statements. Um, download all your bank statements. I know we're we're in an electronic environment where we keep everything, you know, in our phone. We keep everything, we look at everything online, sometimes daily or monthly. But make sure you actually download those statements. Download them into a backup file uh, from January through December and keep them all there because you never know when you're going to need them. Uh, the next thing I would say is reconcile accounts and credit cards. Um, a lot of businesses have business credit cards, which the great thing about the business credit cards is that they do give you a year in statement. But you want to make sure that you're reviewing those things to make sure all the charges on there are actually yours and for your business. So that's something you want to do. This is something that um, many people don't think about. Review your credit terms, contracts, and inventory. Let's talk about reviewing credit terms. You may have entered into a contract or a, a, a credit facility with the bank. You want to know when that's coming up from report for renewal. You want to know if you can renegotiate those terms of that rate. Um, your business may have been done better than what it did when you first applied. So you can always go back to the bank and ask them to renegotiate that. What you started with doesn't mean you have to end with those same credit terms. Review contracts. You know, what contracts do you have that are coming up at the end of the year? Um, are they most beneficial to you? Do you still need them? Can you renegotiate the terms of that contract? You know, with COVID, COVID was a time where everyone had to kind of look at terms and contracts to see if they're favorable to them, if they can get more lax terms, or if you're able to pay your vendors quicker, where you get some kind of discount uh, for paying quickly, you may want to look at that as well. So review your credit terms, contracts, and lastly, inventory. If you are a business that has inventory, where did your in inventory start at the beginning of the year, each quarter, and where you're ending at the end of the year as well. So you want to make sure you're reviewing your inventory, make sure it's still in line, and make sure that you're turning that inventory over as quickly as you need to into cash for your business. Um, the next thing is make year-end purchases, gather and organize receipts. Again, this is something that can be done manually. You got the receipt, you throw it in the box, you keep it moving. Your accountant might frown at you when he sees that, but at least you kept something. But again, there are online tools and apps that allow you to organize receipts. You can take a picture of it. You can download apps to kind of help you download those and keep them in categories like gas, client entertainment, meals. So those are, so those are things you want to do. When I talk about make year and purchases, um, there are several popular things that you see online where they say purchase a vehicle or company equipment um, before the end of the year because you get some tax advantages and write-offs. So that's definitely something you want to consider doing if you're able to, um, but then you also have to consult your CPA and I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, the next thing is after you've looked at everything for 2021, you know, you looked at your, your cash flows, your ins and outs, you looked at your expenses, you looked at your contracts and inventory and terms. What does that mean? What does, how does that help you for the next year? You want to set your financial goals for, for next year. So after you review 2021, what do you want to do different or maybe not? You want to keep going the same way because 2021 was very good. What do you want to do for next year? Set goals for next year, write them down, set goals and write them down. Um, they always say when you write something down, you're more apt to accomplish it. I do a vision board every year. 
um, on January 1st, every year I do a vision board and it's not just a personal vision board. Half of the vision board is my personal goals and half of the vision board is my, my business goals. Whether it's a vision board, whether it's a notepad, whether it's your cell phone taking notes for you, set, set three goals. I would say set three goals. Set a goal financially um, about your business. Set a goal of where you want to see yourself in the business. You may want to step back and, and, and um, allow your partners or your employees to take on more things in your business. You may want to focus on sales more versus actually the, the craft that you have. You know, just think about those things. Um, so I would say setting goals for the next year, very important. The last thing is schedule a meeting with your CPA and professional advisor. Um, be more proactive with setting a meeting with your CPA and a financial advisor. And professional advisors, I, I mean attorney, if you have an attorney or retainer, your marketing specialist, marketing specialist in technology, how do you want, how do you want to market your business differently for the next year? Um, and then also your banker. Your banker is very important. And in my, my um, business, I help businesses find financing. So the great thing to start with is what your banker is, letting them know how much money or what you think you're going to need. Start engaging in that discussion now with your banker if you know you are going to need money to help your business grow. If, if one of your goals for the next year is saying, hey, I want my business to do 250000 this year, and I did 150000 last year, but I want to do 250000 this year, you might need capital to do that. So starting to have those discussions with your banker, with your CPA is important because once your CPA knows that you are in a position or you want to grow your business with capital, your tax strategy may have to be a little bit different. Okay. So, you know, I, I kind of make the statement, you write, you tell Uncle Sam you made some money, but then you tell Uncle Sam that you spent the whole bunch of money. When you get to that bottom line, your banker and myself is saying, well, you spent more money than you made, so you don't qualify now for funding. Well, your CPA's goal usually is just to help your tax liability. They want to prevent you from paying as much taxes as possible. That's the, that's the automatic assumption. But scheduling that meeting with your CPA to say, no, that's not my goal. My goal is to be able to grow my business by getting capital, by borrowing money. I need to look the best on paper that I can absolutely look. I need you to help me tell that story to my banker so they can approve me when I need the extra $100,000 line of credit to help my business grow. So start engaging in those discussions now Regarding your attorney, if there's some contracts that are not that favorable to you no, anymore, those are discussions you want to have with your attorney. Hey, is there a way that you can help me renegotiate this contract or change the terms of this contract so I can either change it or get out of it? Again, so those are just your people you should have on your team to help your business grow. Be proactive with setting the appointments. Don't just wait till they call and say, hey, Send me your tax, your um, your PL and balance sheet, send me your bank statements and your receipts. No, you want to have a discussion about what your strategy is for your business. So I'm gonna stop right there at that category. And at, are there any questions? I'm looking at the chat box. I don't see any questions right now, but Glenda, I love your checklist. Thank you. I mean, it's almost like, and, and, and getting back to looking good on paper, but what I did know is like that when you talk about review your credit terms and negotiate your rates, that is so important that I don't think we really think about because I actually went back and, and negotiated some terms on some credit cards that I had. And I had charges that were refunded back to me because yeah. I renegotiated those terms. So yeah, I think entrepreneurs, yeah. that is really, I think entrepreneurs really need to think about that because sometimes we think things are like etched in stone and in fact, they're not. I would say that everything is open to negotiation. So, so really understand how to flex that negotiation muscle, especially as you build your business. Because again, you may have started at a certain level and, and came back and really improved that level and can go back and say, hey, look at me, look at me now and really negotiate. So thank you for sharing that. That was like invaluable, I thought. You're welcome. And I always say a closed mouth does not get fed. So <laughs> ask the question, open your mouth, you know, ask those questions, whatever is lingering to you. 
um, ask those questions to your, your advisors. And if you don't have those professional advisors, you know, reach out to Antoinette with WEOP. She's very resourceful. Lita, myself, Tamika, everyone on this call, and we're going to share some resources at the end of the, the meeting. Um, reach out to these resources to help you find these advisors that can help you. I think I saw someone raise their hand. Yes, that, yes, that would be me. Um, these, the, this attorney, what type of attorney? Because I know someone who's an attorney and I, I said that I was told by someone else that I should have an attorney on my team. But when I told them that, they said, well, you don't need an attorney for that. And I'm thinking, well, what type of attorney am I looking for? So I would say you want to look for a business attorney that focuses in, on contracts. So I'm not sure what, what type of business are you in, Antoinette? I do need one. I have a childcare business, but I, I need to cover um, contracts in terms of making sure between me and my parents, other business contracts that I, um, you know, deal with. Yes, yeah, so that you just answered your question. So you need a business attorney that focuses on contracts. So having them again review um, the contracts that you have for your parents and and, the, and your your business, um, making sure that they're mutually beneficial to each. Um, knowing when you can cancel or when you can exit a parent and a child if you have to, you know, in a situation, you want to make sure you're legally covered for that. So you would and you and anyone on a call would want to have a business attorney or business co or contract attorney. And can I add that you want to make sure that they specialize in those areas because you don't want to, someone to take your business and they're not really specializing in business development or you know doing prime or subcontracts. So just, and, and I always ask other entrepreneurs what attorneys they utilize because they will share with you entrepreneur, you know, attorneys that they can have conversations with that really specialize in business. Because some you don't want to go to an attorney specializing in accidents and try to talk about business because they will take your business. So right. just you know right. be be clear on that. And again, try to get referrals from other entrepreneurs as well. Yeah. Any other questions before I move to the next topic? Linda, I just want right. to well, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to make a quick statement and just really call out the fact that you um, impress the or, or um, stress the importance of valuation and being intentional about understanding when it's important to make val valuing your business a priority over reducing your tax exposure. Um, because we do sit down with a lot of businesses who are going through succession planning and are ready to exit their businesses, but can't really sell it right so right. Thank you for stressing the importance of valuation yes yes thank you lita so the next topic or the next um part of the checklist is um managing or reviewing your employees and vendors um your employees if you have are the key to helping you have a successful business and as, as well as your vendors so you want to prep any year-end bonuses or gifts. So if you're in the position to provide a year-end bonus or gift, no matter how big or small, it, the gesture means a lot when, when it's coming from a business owner as, as valuing or thinking about their employees or vendors. And when I say vendors, vendors are just as important as employees. They help you um, manage your business by providing services that you're contracting with them. You don't want to take them for granted at all. Um, you don't want to take, you know, the guy that's coming in to, you know, fix your AC unit or whatever it is. You don't want to take for granted your marketing person that you contract out. You want to um, keep them happy as well because they're going to do a better job for you in the end. Even though you're paying them, they're still going to do a better job for you in the end. Um, you also want to verify any employee data. You know, this is a time, um, the next two kind of go together, verify employee data, prepare W-2s and 1099s. If you're manually doing your payroll, you know, you definitely want to make sure you have that information together. If you're using payroll services um, like ADP, paychecks, you know, QuickBooks, you want to make sure the information you have in there is accurate. And I would say, you know, maybe print out that information for that employee or vendor and have them verify it. You know, don't assume that you have it in there correct. Just print it out, have them take a look at it, sign off on it that is correct, and you're, you're covered. 
um, if you provide any benefits, you, you want to review your benefits. Um, if you are in a great position where you're able to provide health um, benefits, that is something that's a contract or a term that needs to be reviewed through your provider. So, so you know, check in with the provider that you're using for those benefits, review them, make sure you still um, need those um, benefits. If you want to increase them, if you're in a great position where you've been profitable and you want to add some more on there, you know, you want to do that. If you need to take some away, you, you need to have that reviewed as well. Um, again, set next year's goals. This is all about, you know, having the business grow and move forward. Set next year's, go next year's goals regarding hiring and retention. You know, are, do you need to hire, you know, another two or three teammates to get you to the next level for your business? Um, do you need to cut back, unfortunately, as well? Do you need to take someone from full-time to part-time? So set those goals regarding where you see your business the next year regarding your team as well. And then last, just a simple thing, you know, thank your employees and vendors. Thank them for a wonderful year. If you had a tough year, we know some industries had a tough, tougher last two years than, than others, like, you know, most of the services, like the restaurant business. Um, thank them, a simple thank you, a handwritten note. You know, if you're unable to provide a financial gift, a handwritten note goes a long way talk about something personal or a personal situation that they helped you out in the business would go a long way with, with your employees and vendors. And will want them to come back with you next year and help you meet your 2022 goals. So um, that's what I have. Does anyone have anything to add? I mean, I know we probably can add a lot of things, but it, does anyone have anything to add that they've done in their business at the end of the year to help them prepare for the next year? Well, Glenda, let me add a, a quick note to which everything that you said, I think is so important for entrepreneurs to make sure that they automate everything because I knew quite a few entrepreneurs that missed out on some of the EIDL loans, et cetera, because they just didn't have an automated process. Because if you have an automated process, your reports, basically what you said earlier, how to look good on paper, having things automated, pulling up those reports, it is so important and so valuable. So we could take anything away from what you said is make sure that you, you can automate everything on your checklist, can be automated by the click of a keyboard. Uh, and that's so important because when bankers or investors or anyone's looking at you to partner, they can be really look, even when you're trying to get prime and subcontracts in the federal sector, Having that automation is going to be so important. So I just kind of wanted to, to emphasize that. Having that software that you can automate your processes. Yes, and you have to think about it as an investment, not an expense. So thinking about it as an investment into your business, um, it's going to save you time and it's going to make you look more prepared and professional for your business. So again, I mentioned QuickBooks was the one that I use that's pretty popular. Um, Wave has one. Um, W-A-V-E, um, uh, I just drew a blank, Wave, Pabli, Zero. I mean, there's several out there. And again, they range from probably $12.95 a month on up. So just really, if you have not automated your business, think about doing it now. Regarding the employees and vendors, believe it or not, to have a payroll service is really inexpensive as well. You got to also think about the expense and the time the investment that you're paying to automate these tools and the time that it takes you to do all these things. As Antoinette said, when you're coming up to bid for a contract or you need that line of credit, they're gonna ask us a lot of financial documents to analyze your business. Um, and to, to, to be able just to click a button to have that information ready and available versus have to go back and pull documents and go through your bank statements line by line and make a sheet, you know, it would definitely save you some time. So does anyone have any other questions before we get to our next speaker? I don't see anything in the chat, so I think we can kind of move forward. Great. So as I mentioned um, in the financial management part of my checklist is scheduling a meeting with your professional advisors. And scheduling, scheduling those meetings allows you not only to talk about your business and get a lot of good resources and tools, 
but allows you to develop relationships and relationships are pretty key. And this next speaker is, I call her a master of relationship development. She <laughs> is a master at it. She can work any room, anywhere. Um, Tamika Stafford with Truist, again, Vice President of Community Development, Power Connections, Relationship That Matters. Tamika. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Glenda, for your kind words and for your amazing presentation. I have to give it right back to her. Glenda has been phenomenal and a partner of mine for years. Um, and I always know when I need clients to get the true story of what's going on and how to get their business to the next level from a lending standpoint, Glenda is always my first call, always. And she never disappoints and she creates miracles. I'm just going to tell you. So I don't know what, what she does, but she, she has some magic going on there, but um, some good magic. So anyway, Thank you for being here. I'm gonna share my screen as well because we're gonna talk a little bit about relationships and why they're important in the banking world. And you may think, well, of course we, we know that. Or maybe you may think, well, no, I'm a digital person. I don't need to come in the bank. Um, I do everything electronically and everything online. But today we're gonna to talk about exactly why it's important that you do as a business owner, establish relationships with your banker. Now, those are just bullet points where we're gonna talk a little bit about um, adding some color around each of those topics. Now, according to a recent McKinsey article, studies have found that business owners with higher levels of business and financial education are more likely to also see higher sales, profits, and survival rates. And typically, Black business owners tend to have a weaker relationship with banking institutions, which can affect their access to loans or help them navigate each stage of their business journey. In fact, to give you specific numbers, fewer than one in four Black-owned employer firms reported having a recent borrowing relationship with a bank. But banking institutions, too, can do their part to help bridge that gap with business owners to broaden the business connection to financial needs. But what exactly is this banking relationship everyone keeps talking about? How do you build one? I mean, are you going on a date? What are we talking about? Well, let's define banking relationships. What is it? It's actually the rapport that you establish with the bank with whom you conduct business transactions. The reason you wanna do that is because it can smooth the way when it comes to loan applications, as Glenda just mentioned, it makes a big difference. Or if you have special requests, there may be things that you need. If you have um, security documents or investment documents and you need a medallion stamp, or you've been a victim of fraud, or there's some unique situation, there's a state, there's something going on in your situation where people, all of us have experienced this where you go to the bank and it seems like they give you the third degree about something that's totally legitimately your business to deal with. If you have a relationship with the bank, that won't happen. It doesn't happen in every case. So that's why we're talking about the importance of making that connection. And as a business owner, you're going to deal with a bank primarily more than a traditional individual would. But ironically, people may think, yeah, but do they care about me? Yes, they do. Bankers want to know their customers as much as the customers need to know them. Where what you're trying to do, the goal is to establish trust between each other. So let's talk about that. The first bullet point is communicating regularly. The step in any relationship, whether it's a friendship, marriage, a, a working relationship, is regular communication. We're talking consistent, positive outreach that transforms you from an account number to a personal contact, right? A banker can't champion for you if they don't know who you are. So the key is consistency. And what I recommend is typically at least semi-annually or twice a year, ideally quarterly, because your business can change quickly for better or for worse. And you want to make sure that you're communicating that. But you may say, but what exactly do we talk about? I mean, that's kind of frequent. You know what? I tell them the first time. What else is there to say? Well, what we'd like to know, of course, is tell us about the history of your company. What drove you to even open this business? The name of it? How has it performed? Bring some financial statements with you or your business plan to help them get a visual of exactly what's happening. And they may be able to provide resources to support you and help you along that journey. And then also as your succession planning, I know that Lita mentioned um, something along those lines, as did Glenda. They can actually have resources in their bank that can help you, whether it can be your next investor, your next customer, your next employee, your next CPA, they're a huge resource for you. They want to understand what you sell, right? Because if they understand what you're selling and how you're improving the economy in their market, that's an easy sell for them to you. Don't sleep on the fact that bankers are connected to everyone, CPAs, accountants, attorneys, real estate agents, business coaches, organizations such as WEOP that help um, business-centric 
and uh, entrepreneurial minded people reach their goals. They know these folks. So you want to make sure that you're connected with them so you can understand and they understand you. Another feature about the communication piece is bankers see other industries and other people in the same business as you. So they can, without divulging confidential information, share with you exactly some success stories or things that are working for other people and maybe some things that you may not want to do. Again, don't sleep on the fact that they can help with that. So take the time to introduce yourself, your business. In fact, what I recommend, let them, and I'm going to tell you how to do it at the end, but let them come to your business. If you have an actual office or a facility, let them come to you. Let them come to you. Let them see your space. That Make them a part of it. Don't let it just be a dialogue. Make, embrace them. Draw them into your business so they can see and they feel the same passion that you do for the company that you birthed. If you don't have an office, that's okay. You can still take them off site if possible. Um, not saying you have to buy them any things. In fact, they may buy it for you. Not always, so don't count on that necessarily. <laughs> but not everybody has the means to do that as far as um, a corporate card or a budget goes. That's the reason for that. But if you take them away out of their element, especially if they're branch leaders, then you will get them to give you their undivided attention. And that's what you want. Because each bank is different as to who you'll be dealing with. And so that's what you'll want to find out. Who is my contact? Now, again, you don't want to disregard or dismiss tellers because tellers are vital. They can make the difference in your deposit being held or not, which can make your life easier or not. Not that they do it purposely. The system tells them what to do. But if they know you, they know your transactions, they know your habits, they see you often, a lot of times they can override that hold to make it available for you as quickly as possible. Now that's a risk that they take for themselves because they can get in trouble if that check comes back. So therefore they're not willing to take a risk for someone they don't know. So don't sleep on the tellers, don't sleep on the bankers, but they're not the relationship manager. So find out from them who exactly is your relationship manager and who should you be really building that relationship with? You still want to know the tellers. You still want to know the bankers, but who's the main one that you want to schedule these quarterly meetings with? Each bank is different. I know our bank is set up where it is done. If you have less than 2 million in revenue, you will be dealing with the branch leader. If you're above 2 million in revenue, you'll be dealing with a business banker. If you're above, and I want to say, don't quote me, I think it's 10 million in revenue, you will be dealing with a commercial banker. And if let's say your business is booming and you're just doing it out of the water and you're publicly traded, um, then you'll deal with the middle markets banker. And we hope that that happens for every single one of you on this call. But there are different segments according to where your business falls as the financial complexities are different. So therefore, you want to make sure you're talking to the right person. And therefore, that person will be in tune to giving you the advice that you need in this, in the, um, at the stage you are in your journey. And they'll give you your time. If you go to a middle markets banker and you're nowhere near their level, think about it. Are they really going to invest time in you? Not really, because you're, that, they don't help in that space. They may not even know how to. So make sure you're dealing with the right person. Um, secondly, allow yourself to be vulnerable. And I think this is something that is a challenge for us, especially sometimes as women, right? Sometimes we, 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 like, to, we like to showcase our, our good points and, and, and hide our bad points. You know what? That's not even women. That's human nature. You can look at TikTok, Instagram, look at any social media. All you're going to see are highlight reels of everyone's great things in life. When it comes to banking and business, that happens too. But when it comes to you developing this relationship, you need to be vulnerable. It may feel intrusive. It may feel invasive and personal. Well, banking is personal. <laughs> it is personal. This is your money. And so therefore, it's important that we know everything about you when it comes to credit, when it comes to your business, when it comes to your financials, what's hurting you, what's impacting your cash flow, what your success is attributed to. We need to know those things. And facing negative news is a part of running a business. It's not going to all be peaches and cream, right? But it's how you handle those objections and those obstacles that determine the success. And then they can give you honest insight into the business. Remember what I said earlier, the banker can help you when it comes to telling you about some successes they've seen from other people and what they've done or how other people have overcome that obstacle. Now, that's why too, before that time comes, if you have a relationship with them, You'll want to make sure that you get that credit line or credit, some type of credit established before the hard times come, right? When they get to know you and they love you and you don't even have a need, that's when you need to get that credit line. That's when you need to get that credit card. You may say, but I don't, I don't like debt. I bootstrapped. I'm proud of that. I don't want to incur debt. No, you don't. But when you get into a bind and in a hard spot, even if your banker, your relationship manager loves you to pieces and trusts you implicitly, there is only so much they can do. 
So therefore you want to get it while the getting is good. Basically get the umbrella before it starts raining. Because once it starts, it may be difficult to get that and you don't want that to happen. So that's why it's good to let them help you. If they offer you a line of credit, I know it, it feels good to be, to be sought after. Take it, take it, even if you don't need it. That's what I recommend in that space. Now, of course you want to be uh, selective, right? If there are a lot of fees involved, um, you know, and, and if they're asking for collateral that you're really not comfortable pledging, well, of course that may be something you'd want to reconsider. But if it's unsecured credit, where all you're doing is signing your name or even providing a few financials, go for it because um, the time may come when it'll be difficult, whether it's an economic reversal for your business or it could be, heaven forbid, you're a victim of identity theft. You want to make sure that at least once you have those lines, you can use them. Third, building a track record. Again, relationships don't happen overnight. They're built over time. So don't expect to win the banker over in one single meeting. Consistent communication is what demonstrates their financial fitness and it's most effective over the long haul. So make sure you get to know them and continually consistently schedule these meetings. And I'm gonna tell you how to do it once we finish this section right here. Fourth bullet point, create a network. Bankers are typically well-connected in the market. We talked a little bit about that. They can introduce you to people that can help your business grow or to someone you may wanna meet in their network. So I recommend if you don't have a LinkedIn profile because that's the business profile, um, the business Facebook, business Instagram, make sure that you have that so you can connect with them and at least people see your visibility on, on this, um, in the social arena. They need to know who you are. Let them see you there and let them connect you with folks. You may want to connect with someone. You can go to their profile. Let's say the profile of someone who can really help you get your business to the next level. If you go to, let's say, Lita's profile or to Glenda's profile, you may find that she's connected to that person. Even if she hides her connections, it'll show you mutual connections. So therefore, you can still see, oh, wow, Glenda is connected to so-and-so at MARTA. Lita is connected to so-and-so at um, Georgia Power. And that can be a way. Now, because you know Lita, you know Glenda, you've met us today. So therefore, you may say, hey, I see you're connected to so-and-so. Can you introduce me? Can you make an introduction? That's what I'm talking about. Do that with your banker as well, because they can also help you when it comes to connecting with people. So now how do we do this? This all sounds great hypothetically. This sounds all nice and well and good, but what exactly does that look like? Well, I'm about to tell you. So usually if you're opening your account in a branch, a banker is gonna be the one that's opening it, but you may decide to do it online. Either way, you're not gonna be dealing primarily with the relationship manager. Now in the case again of Truist, as I mentioned, if you're under 2 million in revenue, it's the branch leader. So once you get your account opened, you want to schedule an appointment with them. Glenda mentioned this earlier. Don't wait for them to call you because they might, but sometimes they get overwhelmed. They have a lot of stuff going on. Call them and don't just roll up in there because <laughs> if you do, they may be busy. They may not be there. They may have another appointment and that's gonna cause frustration for you and them because they do wanna see you, but they just don't have the capacity at that time. So schedule an appointment. Schedule an appointment with them at a time that's convenient for both of you. I recommend Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, because from um, a banking standpoint, typically Mondays and Fridays are nuts. So Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays are typically better. Um, mornings are better too, but again, work with your schedule. Schedule it with them and don't just schedule it. Send a calendar invite with a reminder for yourself. If you're not in the habit of doing that, get in the habit because the bankers live by those calendars. And if it's not on there, it's not going to happen. So typically they'll set their own appointments, but I recommend if you're initiating the contact, you send them a calendar invite so that they have it on their calendar with the bullet points of maybe what you want to discuss. Now, let's say you're going to be late. Let's say you can't make it. Call them, email them, notify them and let them know because their time is valuable as is yours. And it may be hard to get a second appointment if you're a no-show. So you want to make sure that you are clear about how you value their time. And also... I recommend call them for an appointment and email them because you know what that does? It teaches you how they are best, most responsive. Do they respond to your phone call? Do they respond to your email? That'll let you know which is the way to get them the fastest if you need them fast because some people are different. Some people love phone calls. Some people love emails. Some like both. It just depends. You'll get to learn what their habits are. Second, you'll want to tell, um, tell them why you want to meet with them. You want to Introduce yourself, tell them about your long-term and short-term business goals, and learn how the bank can be your financial partner. How can you help me? What can you do to help me on my journey? And if they say, well, they don't have time and they can't meet with you or you're too small or they don't, you're in the wrong place. 
clearly that's a sign to you. You are not at a bank that really has your interest at heart. You may, but I'm too small that surely they want, no, banks should help you no matter what stage you're in. And if they don't want to help you, you're in the wrong place. So you need to shop around and that's where your network comes in or meeting people like me or Glenda, Lita, Antoinette, all know tons of bankers in our spaces and we can help you with someone who's actually caring about your business, whether you're in the ideation stage or whether you're a full blown five figure, six figure business, seven figure business, which is what we're aiming for, right? We want to help you in that space. So now let's say you've done all that. You told them where you want to meet. Again, arrange to meet them at your office if possible to get their undivided attention. You may want to do coffee, whatever. It's up to you. You don't have to pay for them. Um, they may even pay for you. Um, let's see. Also, like I said, send your financials in advance, share your vision, and you know what's going to make you more memorable? This is the icing on the cake. Ask them how you can help them. Ask them, can I introduce you to clients? Are there, who would you like to meet? Who are you trying to connect with? I mean, let me tell you a tip of who bankers love. Bankers typically love accountants, like CPAs, um, business coaches, they love financial planners, they love insurance agents, they love, um, they love organizations such as WEOP, um, anybody that you can introduce them to in those spaces, they will love. And of course, they always love clients and referrals for loans. If you can help them in that way, and again, it's not about having to do that, but I'm just telling you how to set yourself apart and stand out from the pack. If you can say, you know what, I have a friend that needs to open an account. Can I set them up with you? They'll never forget you. They'll love you for life. And again, if you're scheduling those regular calls and meetings with them, then you will have found you a partner for life. And before I wrap up, I will say, remember, it's important to know the team because bankers, sometimes we change jobs and change positions like we change our clothes. So you need to know a team of people. So if you know that banker, know the people at that branch too. So that way when the replacement comes, if that your contact leaves, your, the contact that comes in now is new. They don't know who you are. They're trying to understand this whole portfolio they can then say the team that's already there can say, oh, oh yeah, that, that's Lita Speller. Oh yeah, no, you want to take care of Lita. Lita has been banking with us for a long time. Oh, Glenda, Glenda has three businesses and she's brought them all here and she brings us clients. That's what you want them to speak for you and advocate for you. That's what relationships do for you. So in closing, I'll say, don't just say this is good information. Yes, I'm going to do this, but then put it aside and you walk away and get busy with life. You need to call or email your banker today. I challenge every single one of you. Contact them by email and by phone. Remember what I said, because that's going to let you know how they respond. And then tell them you want to schedule an appointment with them so you can build a banking relationship. If they don't respond, give them a second chance because emails get lost. I'm just going to say, and I, I can attest to that. But if you find that they just simply don't have a vibe where they care about your business and they're not interested, move on. There are plenty of us that are. And you can contact me. I'm definitely happy to help you at whatever stage you're in. So thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Tamika. That was great information. I don't see anything in the chat. Uh, I do have a question now. Tamika, bankers will come to your business? Absolutely. They love to come to businesses, especially if you have a space that they can tour. If you're a factory or you manufacture or you have a storefront, they love oh. that. In fact, sometimes they have to do that for loans and Glenda can speak to that in her experience as a commercial lender. They have to do that sometimes, but they enjoy doing it. It helps them see how serious you are. And when your eyes light up as you tell your story, it does something mm -hmm. to us personally. So yeah, we totally will come. Okay, I think Markeela said something and she said, knowing the team is so important. My banker left the company. I knew the team, but they did not advocate as hard. Perhaps they weren't in a position to do so to, to do such. So Mark yeah. Keeler shared that with them. Um... Yeah, and that can happen. I guess it just depends on that team and that banker. Then you know what? You're starting from square one. But at this point, you can tell them how you had a relationship with the previous, their predecessor and say, look, I know you're new and welcome to the team and I'm happy that you're here. And say, I'd like to schedule an appointment with you to tell you a little bit about my business and tell them about basically how you had a relationship so you can set a standard set an expectation. And if they're not willing to meet up to that, find someone who is. Yes. Because again, that's gonna be important for you to have that advocate. Great advice, Tamika. Again, Tamika is, is, is definitely a relationship-driven banker. 
Um, you have bankers that are more transactional or more bankers that are into developing relationships. So you definitely want to bank with a bank that's interested in, in meeting with you and speaking with you and hearing and learning about your business. And again, if you don't have that bank, you know, you got Tamika Stafford on the call where you can reach out to her and she definitely can help you with that. So thank you so much, Tamika. So we talked about preparing a checklist to help us, you know, look at the, the, the year and focus on the new year. We talked about developing relationships. So now that you've done all that, you know, the next thing is, you know, how do you protect your future? How do you protect your business? Um, you work so hard and that's your biggest asset, you know, how do you protect it? So we have Alita Speller here. She's going to talk about uh, financial planning and different insurance tools to help you protect your personal and your business because a lot of times they intertwined. So Lita, I'm going to turn it over to you and we're looking forward to hearing about protecting our biggest asset. Unmute. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Glenda. And good, good morning. In just a few minutes, good afternoon, everyone. And again, it is awesome to be here. Um, so I actually have a few uh, slides. We'll move through them pretty quickly. Um, but I want to start by, I will, I guess I better share my screen. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Okay, there we go. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. Ladies, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it. All right, awesome. So I'm actually going to start by introducing someone to you. So um, the woman in these pictures is my grandmother. And I wanted to take this approach because it's the holidays, right? And, and I'm, I've been missing her a lot. Um, but so the woman in these pictures is my grandmother. Um, in the picture on the left, she's 42 years old and, and holding her first grandchild. Uh, she was a young wife, a young mother. Um, and as a matter of fact, at the time of this picture on the left, she still had her own five, eight, nine, and 10 year old girls at home. She and my grandfather had their first child at 20 and their last at 37, right? So her life was pretty complex. Now, when you look at the picture on the right, um, that was actually taken with her favorite grandchild, me. <laughs> <laughs> 50 years later, um, and, and actually three months before she passed away at age 92. Now, by this time, she had retired. She'd been retired for 30 years. She had been widowed for 28 and she'd seen tragic losses and some beautiful opportunities. And what both of these pictures convey, at least to me and in my mind, is that just like most of us, her family was her most precious treasure. And even in her last days, she wanted to get the most and the best she could out of her life. And as you can see in that picture on the right, um, she was so down with the all, whites, uh, the all white party for her son's 70th birthday, right? So again, like most of us, she just wanted to get the most out of her, out of her life and the best um, out of life. So I am going to I'm really, okay, there we go. All right. So I share my grandmother with you because her life really does feel my passion for educating women about financial planning. And it was relatively long, it was complex. And again, like just like many of you, she had her financial goals and her financial challenges that would have been best addressed by leveraging expertise and resources to Glenda's earlier point, but building a team, leveraging expertise and resources that, help, that would have helped her achieve um, and overcome them. So to so all of you amazing, enterprising women, how do you prepare for long-term success? So what I want to do is to just take a couple of minutes and share with you what I would share with my, you know, younger grandmother if I had the opportunity to sit down with her today. And quite frankly, what I share with many women who like her 
will go on to live very long, complicated, and certainly financially complicated lives, especially as business owners. So what do you want to do in terms of planning for long-term success? The first thing you want to do is get your financial house in order. It is fundamental and foundational to our long-term financial success, protecting our personal finances and protecting our businesses. We have to do things like create a budget. You know, it, it doesn't have to be to the penny, but we do need to know what's coming in and what's going out in our personal finances and in our business finances. And you know what I would say to my younger grandmother and what probably needs to be said to a lot of us in terms of getting your financial house in order and having a budget, sometimes it requires you to say no to people, right? Whether it's your son, your daughter, <laughs> your spouse, your friend, your employee, sometimes you have to say no. Wealth is created by retaining a portion of your income and putting it to work. The second thing I would say when it comes to protecting our finances and protecting our, uh, our personal and business finances would be maintain good credit. I won't go into this a lot. I think you know that would be beating a dead horse. I think we all kind of have some sense of this pretty intimately, but there's so many tools and so many resources out there to help us do that, to maintain and you know, to create and maintain good credit. Um, it is often a key factor in something that both Tamika and Glenda just talked about, just, which is um, access to capital right? And being able to maintain liquidity in our personal and um, business finances. Kind of the big meat, uh, 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 the big meat of this conversation is preparing for the unexpected. How do you, how do you, how do you protect yourself and your business from the unexpected? So one thing you want to do is you want to build an emergency reserve. There are certainly some rules of thumb around this. And again, this conversation is so commonplace. I won't go into that much here. You know, the rules of, rules of thumb around whether you should have three, six or 12 months in expenses. The fact of the matter is this, cars break down, furnaces break down, we get sick and can't work. <laughs> you know, we, we lose jobs, we have dry spells in the revenue generation in our businesses. Life happens and you need to have a reserve in place both for your personal finances and for your business finances, whether that is liquid cash or whether that's some degree of credit worthiness or your line of credit that helps you to um, maintain liquidity if your revenue or income um, is disrupted. So that is one major way in which you need to protect, again, not only your personal finances, but your business finances. Another way that you prepare for the unexpected is to transfer risks to insurance, which is, which can be for, for sure very difficult for us as business owners. You know, health insurance, we know kind of what, you know, how, what that challenge can be as a business owner. There are brokers out here, there are professionals out here that you can talk to and trust. Antoinette said earlier, um, you know, get recommendations and referrals from other entrepreneurs who may be a little further ahead of the journey than you are at the moment, right? But transfer risk to insurance. Talk to someone about, you know, what they're doing for their own health insurance if you're currently un, um, under or uninsured in terms of health insurance. I can go on all day about um, what a six-figure hospital bill looks like, right? So that is one way in which you want to protect yourself and your business. Another way is disability insurance. I'm telling you, what is so real amongst us as um, minority or specific, I would say specifically Black female business owners, is that oftentimes we are the sole source of income in our households. If we don't work and generate income to keep our roof over our head or our, ourselves and our families fed, then guess what? We're not sheltered and we don't eat. So protect your income. Look into things like disability insurance, 
right? If you're the sole earner in your household and if you get sick and you can't work in your business or you're injured and you can't work in your business, there are solutions in the marketplace where you can have insurance or protection that will replace a portion of your income. So many of us as business owners believe that tools like that are inaccessible to us, but you, there are solutions out there that can be customized so that you can maximize uh, the solution to suit your budget. The main thing that you want to do is to have some kind of protection around your, your income in the event that something happens and you are unable to work in or on your business. Another way you want to protect your business is business overhead insurance, if that works for your style of business. So let's say that you are unable to generate a uh, revenue in your business because you've been injured or because you're, you're, you're sick. Well, there is also a type of insurance that will, you know, where there's insurance that will replace your income, but there's also protection that will help you replace the revenue that would be generated through your business. And so you can do things like have this insurance kick in if you're not able to work, but let's say you have a colleague or there is a professional in your space who is willing to step in and fill in the gap for you while you're recovering or while you're figuring out your next step. I just had that incident happen with one of my clients last year who was unfortunately diagnosed with cancer and literally had to drop everything and start treatment and had multiple projects in the air. But fortunately to Tamika's earlier point, I was able to say, listen, I have a client who has a business almost exactly like yours. I would love to connect you to to see if he would be willing to step up and to collaborate with you in some way to help keep your projects going. Well, he wasn't going to invest his time for nothing at all, right? And so she was able to have that protection kick in and pay the professional who was able to step into her place and keep her projects afloat for that time. So things like disability insurance, business overhead insurance, and life insurance. Listen, none of us like to talk about it. I hate talking about it. And it's foundational to the work that I do. <laughs> I, I, I don't enjoy talking about it, but it is critical. Life happens. Listen, um, on November 9th, I, I'm working on a book project with the team. And on November 9th, I swear to you, I got a, a, an email from someone at 1020 that morning who was murdered four hours later. And so life happens, it happens, beautiful things happen and horrible unexpected things happen. And what you want to do is plan for longevity, plan that you're going to be here to ride it out, but also build into that plan the what ifs, right? How do we protect ourselves around the what ifs? And life insurance is just one of those what if scenarios that we have to plan for. And quite frankly, something that we as a community can get better at. Um, the next two points, I actually want to kind of take these together. How do you protect not only what you have going on today, but also your future, right? At some point, you're going to want to step away from full-time work, whether you're working in your business or whether you're working, you know, as a full-time employee, at some point, you're going to want to walk away, maybe, right? But most of us at least want the freedom to be able to decide to walk away from having to work. Well, the best way to be able to do that is to put your money to work by investing and to also make sure that you're building a healthy nest egg for retirement. And I would say as, as women and as black women specifically, we are a segment of the US population um, that is least prepared to maintain our desired standard of living when we retire. And unfortunately, too many of us live in poverty during those years. And so we want to put our money to work. And two primary reasons um, that that is the case is that number one, we don't save at a high enough rate so we can get better there. And number two, when we do save, we're afraid to take the investment risks 
um, that are necessary to reach our financial goals. So finally, what I wanna say is, let's talk about risk, because I really feel like that's an important conversation when talking to women about protecting their future. We have to be willing to take some investment risks. So let's look at, again, if I had an opportunity to sit down with that 42-year-old woman who, was, who would become my grandmother um, today, and she comes to me and she says, look, I'm 42, I've saved zero for retirement, um, but I wanna get started. Um, I want to save something, but I can't really afford to save much. Um, and even more than that, I'm willing to save, but I don't want to take, I don't want to risk losing any money. So what should I do? And I say that as if it is um, hypothetical when it's a conversation that I have very often. And so what I want to do is put risk in perspective. So let's say this 42 year old has some options, right? There are three options, quite frankly, that she has for her money. She could spend it, right? I enjoy spending money. I think we all enjoy spending money. It gets us great things and great experiences. So she could just say, let's say she said, okay, the most I can, the most I feel as though I can set aside a month or I can even think about doing something with the month is $250. I'm $250 a month, which I think is, you know, is, a, is a good number for working women. Um, and it's certain, let me just say, there's no right or wrong. The important thing is that we all are doing the best that we can do. And for some people that looks like 250 a month. And so for some people that looks like $2,500 a month. Let's just all commit to doing the best that we can do. So let's say she has $250 a month, she's 42. She's like, uh, I'm starting late. I'm, I'm just gonna go ahead and commit to working the next 30 years in my business. And we're, take, we're putting aside the fact that she is likely building some great valuation in her business. But let's just look at, look at it from the perspective of investing to protect our future. So she could spend the $250 a month for 30 years, right? Um, and if she did that, keeping up with inflation at about 3% a year, at the end of those 30 years, she just would have spent $142,000 $142, plus, right? With nothing to show for it. Or she could say, you know what? I'm just going to take that $250 and save it in my, just my bank savings every month. I don't want to take any risks. I'm scared of the stock market. I don't want to lose money. Well, she could do that. And assuming the interest rates, the interest rate environment remains very similar to what it is now, we can just assume um, that she won't make anything. <laughs> um, and what's also true is that the power of her dollar is being eroded, right? Because she could buy, she could take a dollar and buy a loaf of bread this, you know, this year, but next year, that same loaf of bread is a dollar and three cents, right? And that compounds year after year. So she could just take that $250 a month, put it in a bank account, make nothing. And her purchasing power will have declined to about even after putting away about $90,000 over that time, she would have about $35,000 in purchasing power, or she could invest it. And she could use a vehicle as simple as a Roth IRA. And she could say, you know what, Lita, I want to take my $250 a month and I'm putting it to work. Well, she could take that $250 a month, or let's call it $3,000 a year, set up a Roth IRA and invest it and put it to work. And if we assumed that the next 30 years would be anything like or be like the 30 years between 1991 and 2000, she would have $476,000 in a Roth IRA account. And so that is how you protect your future. You put your money to work. You protect by transferring risks to things like emergency reserves and insurance policies today. And you protect your future by saving and investing. Um, so that's really all I have for you ladies today. Those four points, just prepare, prepare for longevity. Prepare for longevity, be prepared for the what ifs and go through these four, these th four exercises, implement these four, four points. And that's it. That was great, Lita. 
Yes. No, and I'm sorry, was I sitting here with my video off the whole time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were, but we, we got already got this great. <laughs> your, your words were captivating us, so you're fine. And you had great <laughs> visuals. <laughs> good, good. I'm glad those were helpful. Um, yes, yes. Well, Lita shared some some amazing information about protecting yourself, your business. Um, does anyone have any questions for her? What comments? I have a question. Lita, that was amazing, first and foremost. Um, so I'm a firm, I love quotes. I'm a firm believer that knowledge is power, but strategy is king. And how you broke down like the Roth IRAs and all that good stuff, like just making our money work for us. My question is, and I think I've asked you this question before, but I can I can always hear it over and over. Um, do you recommend us using like whole life insurance policies also to kind of invest our money and let it work for us in that way and how? If so, how? Yes. So um, great question, Keela. And I think you may have asked this before, but it's a great question. And please ask it as often as you need to. Um, so whole life is a solution where you can absolutely accumulate wealth, right? So is it a product that works for that works for everyone? No, I would say it's similar to the Roth in that you can access it tax free. Um, you can you absolutely receive some growth on what's invested. Um, you do have some cap on earning potential, whereas when you're market invested, your um, upside potential is unlimited. But what's also true about market investments is that you do have downside risk. And in a whole life policy, you have no downside risk. I find, generally speaking, cash value life insurance policies, I find them to be very powerful. The, 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 the question is whether or not or is the question is deciding which ones best um, solve your problem. What I will say about whole life in today's environment is that whole life insurance is, is, is um, the cash value portion of it is highly dependent on the interest rate environment. And when you're, I, I would ask my, my advisor to have me um, as less dependent on the interest rate environment as possible, right? Um, but with everything, there are pros and cons. Um, but yes, I think whole life can certainly be a viable tool for long time for long term wealth building. It has its pros, it has its cons, like everything else in the marketplace. And the exercise that you want to do is to go through whether or not it is an actual solution for you. Thank great. you. Thank you, Lita. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that was great information. I was, I was going to say, Glenda, before, I don't want to run out of time because I want to make sure we have some great resource partners, the Urban League and also Small Business Majority. So I wanted to give them a few moments where they could just share because we're going into 2022 and they have some great resources. I know I, I have everybody's email address. So on behalf of WEAP, we can always send an email out and recap this workshop and also share WEAP information. But I wanted to give the floor to the, the two resource partners. So they, before we hit 1230, they can just share resources. And then maybe before we, uh, we have a few moments for questions before we end at 1230. So Glenda, is that okay? Yes, Antoinette. So first we have Kimberly Lee. Kimberly Lee is with the Urban League of Greater Atlanta. She is the Director of Entrepreneurship Center. So Kimberly, um, welcome. And we would love to hear about your organization and what resources you have. Good afternoon and thank you. Thanks again for having us here and uh, having me as a partner. Um, I just wanted to, I just, I'll quickly give a <laughs> update. Um, but the Urban League of Greater Atlanta's Entrepreneurship Center, it really was a design to assist entrepreneurs, um, you know, so that they can start up their business and helping them to grow to a successful and sustainable business. Um, but again, we utilize um, subject matter experts to support our programming, our training, and all the initiatives that we um, tend to provide to small businesses. And we do this through training, training classes, resources, and one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen as I am speaking. Uh, 
Oops. I'm going to turn it into a presentation first. And then I'll... This is always so tricky. Okay. And so with that, um, I just want to share that, you know, our training and coaching, it's really done to satisfy the various business needs around accounting, marketing, uh, business management, business planning, strategizing, um, procurement, and uh, just many other things that are needed for the small business. Um, but again, here's some of our upcoming programs. Um, in December, Truist is our sponsor for the construction discussion series. And so this way we can assist our construction firms to prepare for the economic boom that is happening around Greater Atlanta. Uh, these workshops will help firms to really think about how they can prepare. Um, on the second, we have our, and that's this week, our building capacity and certification. The building capacity portion is going to be done by our very own um, 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 oh gosh, why did I just lose her name? Um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, Lita. Oh no, not Lita. Lita, not Lita. It is. Um, oh gosh. We we know, know what it is, so we can. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, but I will make sure you all get that. Um, okay. Uh, information. But anyway, um, we'll be doing building capacity, and the certification will be done by the City of Atlanta, um, Richard Case. Um, and then we'll move on to the ninth. We have capital and bonding and insurance. We have our contracting and procurement session. And then our marketing and networking, we will be um, having, uh, Rachel will be presenting on that one. And um, as we go into January, we have our startup accelerator and our growth accelerator. So both of those uh, initiatives are going to be eight week long programs. The startup uh, begin on the 11th, but that'll be every Tuesday for eight weeks, and the Growth Accelerator on the 13th. Um, this way, this will uh, help us to be able to kind of help people with, you know, kicking off the year, um, especially those businesses that will be starting up. And as you know, at the first part of the year, a lot of businesses do kick off their um, new initiatives and start rethinking or re uh, branding their business. We will have some ongoing coaching throughout from now until the end of next year, which is sponsored by Regions Bank. Um, these coaching sessions, uh, people will be able to go to our website and schedule a coaching with the subject matter experts. And it's not set up yet, but it will be set up and I will make sure I get that information over to EAP to share. Um, they will be able to identify, you know, the need that they have, whether it's, you know, strategizing for 2022 or maybe even thinking about how they are going to do their um, uh, taxes and financials, you know, restructuring those types of things for 2022. So those, that's just a snippet. And um, on the screen, I do have our contact information. Please feel free to call our office, send an email to our coordinator. Um, and yes, Deborah um, McClary is still with the Urban League, um, but you can send an uh, email to uh, Yasmin Edge. She is our coordinator for our programming and or visit our website, uh, ulgatl.org so that you can kind of find out more information and the many upcoming workshops, trainings, programs that we have coming up that are ongoing throughout the year. So appreciate the time to allow me to share that with you all. And thanks again. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you so much. So next we have another great resource with um, the Small Business Majority Outreach Center, Rachel Sanklin. Rachel, um, great for you being here today. Please share what resources you have for us. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Rachel Shanklin, and I just want to say thank you so much for allowing me to be here. I I'm not a business owner, but I work with a lot of small business owners and I just feel like I have absorbed so much information that I'm processing that I wanna share with other people. So thank you for the presenters um, for sharing your expertise. I definitely learned a lot. Um, so as Glenda said, I'm Rachel Shanklin. I'm Georgia Outreach Manager for Small Business Majority. Um, small Business Majority is a national small business organization that empowers America's entrepreneurs to build a thriving and inclusive economy. 
We engage a network of more than 85,000 uh, small businesses across the country um, and partner with 1,500 business organizations and other partner organizations to advocate for public policy solutions and deliver resources to entrepreneurs that promote equitable small business growth. Um, so partnering you know, with the SBA, with organizations like WEOP, um, partnering with community development financial institutions to really provide resources that folks may not know are available to them. Um, we focus on educating the public about key issues uh, that impact America's entrepreneurs with a special focus on advancing the smallest businesses and those facing systemic inequalities. Um, here is a quick uh, visual of our model. Um, our organization has two organizational initiatives, the first being policy and advocacy. Uh, we develop and support policies that benefit the entire small business ecosystem, ranging from boosting access to responsible capital, ensuring affordable access to quality health care, um, and growth-oriented equitable tax and employment policies. Um, we encourage our small business owners in our network to speak out publicly and share their unique stories about why they support such policies and how it will be beneficial to their bottom line. Um, one thing that I really love about our organization is that we have a really excellent communications team that um, does a lot of media placements, whether that's opinion pieces, uh, letters to the editor about small business issues where we really bring in the small business voice um, and really encourage small business owners to advocate for themselves because policy intersects with banking, with um, equitable lending, with taxes. Um, so we, we feel that it's very important that small business owners, you know, have a seat at the table when those policies are being put together. Um, additionally, we do have an entrepreneurship program. We provide a suite of educational programs and resources to small business owners, their employees, and the self-employed entrepreneurs. Um, so like I said before, partnering on webinars, while we're not a TA or technical assistance provider, we do work with those organizations to um, really facilitate intersections that may not be happening. So here is my contact information. Um, we do have one event coming up on December 16th with the Georgia Department of Economic Development. Um, they're going to be talking about how to get involved with um, their agency and different um, state procurement contracts that are going to be available in 2021. So I will put the registration link into the chat. Um, lastly, I just wanted to really highlight um, our VentureEyes portal. This is our partner website that we took over in 2018 from Opportunity Finance Network. Um, it's a big part of our entrepreneurship program. It's an existing educational lending platform that gives small businesses increased access to responsible capital. Um, it offers unbiased education and resources for small business owners that may be seeking loans and provides the technical assistance um, many entrepreneurs need to become loan ready. And you can also find on there um, resources for health insurance plans, retirement, capital, and loans. So I will be putting those links into the chat box. Um, here are our links as well. If you'd like to join our mailing list, we have you know periodic webinar events um, coming up, especially in the new year. We're going to be doing a monthly webinar with the SBA, um, just going over uh, small business updates. So please do tune in and feel free to email me if you have additional questions or um, you want to get involved. And I should have mentioned we are a 501c3 nonprofit. So all of our um, resources and events and membership, all of that is free of charge. And thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you, Rachel. So we are two minutes. We have two minutes left, left Antoinette. Do you have any closing remarks? Uh, yes, on behalf of the Women's Entrepreneurial Opportunity Project Incorporated, I would like to thank everybody for attending today. I would like to thank our great phenomenal speakers uh, that shared this, the great information. Thank you. Uh, to everyone for speaking uh, today at the events. And we, this is session, it will be recorded. So we're gonna continue sharing this great information with our public, with our whole circle of women. So thank you all speakers. Thank you for uh, facilitating. And I really enjoyed all the information that was presented. So, so uh, Glenda, thank you for pulling everything together. You were one of our major partners and instrumental in brainstorming and saying, hey, let's do this before the end of the year. And I wanted to do, and we 
both mutually agreed on doing something really quick so we can provide some snippets of information. So Glenda, thank you for this brainstorm and thank you for spearheading and thank you for moderating and hosting. Alita, thank you as well. Tamika, thank you. Thank all our resource partners, Kimberly and, and Rachel. So I say great things happen when women, women come together and you made this thing amazing and great today. So thank you. Thank you, we all. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. And I didn't see anything in the chat box. Let me double check. The information was so concise and great. I think we answered all the questions. Yes, I think. Uh... Okay, Kenyana, Kenyana wrote something long. Marquila said, amazing. Thanks, great session. Wonderful, valuable presentation. So everyone have a great Christmas. Happy holidays, happy new year. And Glenda, share any party words that you would like to share with us. You're mute. <laughs> Ladies, you, we have all made it through the last couple of years of business. 2020 and 2021 have been quite challenging. Mm -hmm. So if you, you made it, you're here today, give yourself a round of applause and Yay. continue success in 2022. And you know how to find us all. Yes, and you, uh, Antoinette, will you be sharing contact information separately? Uh, yes, uh, sharing what, well, you know, I have to be very, I have to protect everyone's privacy. However, we're going to put this up on YouTube. Perfect. So we're going to make it public so they can go back and share it with their friends. It has all the contact information in so they can visit WeOps YouTube channel. And I usually, we usually email everybody that attends our workshop saying, hey, thank you for attending. Uh, check out the recording. And here's where you can find us. So you can share the link with others who did not have a chance to, to attend this morning as well. So yes, Perfect. and to answer to your question, yes, it will be shared. All right. Thank you, ladies. Have a wonderful holiday. Happy New Year's and much success in 2022. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody.